Welcome back to Pristress Concrete Structures. This is the third lecture in module 4 on design of members. In this lecture, we shall study the design of sections for flexure, specifically the final design of type 2 members. Before we start, let us recapitulate that what do we need in a design process. For design under service loads, the following quantities are known. MDL, the moment due to dead load, which is not including the self-weight yet, and MLL, which is the moment due to life load. The unknown quantities are the member cross-section and geometric properties, MSW, which is the moment due to self-weight. AP, the amount of pre-stressing steel, PE, the effective pre-stress and E, the eccentricity. The material properties are selected at the onset of design. As we had learned earlier that the design process can be conveniently divided into two stages. The first is the preliminary design and next is the final design. We are summarizing the preliminary design here. In the preliminary design, first select the material properties FCK and FPK, which are the characteristic strengths of concrete and the steel respectively. Determine the depth of beam, which is represented as H, which may be based on the architectural requirement. Select the type of section. This also depends on the application. Next, calculate the self-weight, then calculate the total moment MT including the moment due to self-weight. Next, estimate the lever arm. The lever arm is estimated as a fraction of the total height. Next, estimate the effective pre-stress. The effective pre-stress is equal to the moment divided by the lever arm. Calculate area of pre-stressing steel by assuming that the effective pre-stress is about 70 percent of the characteristic strength. AP is equal to PE by FPE. And finally, check the area of the cross section so that it is not too way off and this checking is based on that the stress at the CGS is around 50 percent of the allowable compressive stress in the concrete. Now once we have done the preliminary design, we are moving on to the final design. Now before we move on to the final design, we need to know whether we are doing a type 1 member, type 2 member or type 3 member. Now in type 1 member, no tensile stress is allowed under service loads or a transfer. For type 2 member, tensile stresses are allowed, but they should be within the cracking stress. And for type 3 member, the tensile stress can exceed the cracking stress, but still it is limited to a certain value which limits the crack width. We had studied the final design of 
type 1 members. Today we are going to study the final design of type 2 members. For type 3, the design procedure is exactly similar as type 2 except the allowable tensile stress is different for type 3 members as compared to type 2. Now we are moving on to the design of type 2 members. To summarize, for type 2 members, the tensile stress under service loads and at transfer is within the cracking stress of concrete. The allowable tensile stress in concrete, which is represented as FCT allowable as per IS 1343 1980, is same for transfer and service load conditions. The value is 3 Newton per millimeter square which can be increased to 4.5 Newton per millimeter square for temporary loads. Thus, as per IS 1343, the allowable tensile stress which is limited within the cracking stress is same for transfer and at service, but for other international codes this two value may be different. The following material provides the steps for sections with small self wet moment. That means the eccentricity that we are calculating does not violate the cover requirements. For sections with large self wet moment, the eccentricity E may need to be determined based on the cover requirements. For type 1 member, also we had the same case that we found that if the self wet moment is too high, then the eccentricity that we calculate based on the allowable tensile stress may violate the cover requirements and in that case the eccentricity is limited based on the minimum cover that needs to be provided. For the design, the first step in the final design is calculate eccentricity E to look at the centroid of the pre-stressing steel which is the CGS. Under the self wet, C may lie outside the current region for type 2 members. The lowest possible location of C due to self wet is determined by the allowable tensile stress at the top. The following sketch explains the extreme location of C due to the self wet moment MSW at transfer. In this sketch, on the left hand side, we find that C is located at the CGS or at T in absence of any external moment. Now, when the self wet moment acts, C moves up from T through a distance equal to E2. But for a type 2 member, it may not enter the current region for the self it to act and tensile stress to generate during the acting of the self it. It is still at a distance E1 from the bottom most from current point and we find that here the C is outside the current region unlike the type 1 member and the lowest permissible location of C is governed by how much tensile stress we are allowing at the top. That means it is based on the FCT allowable at the top at transfer. From the figure, the shift of C due to self wet gives an expression of E2. E2 is equal to MSW by P0. This is the liver arm which generates to counteract the self at moment. It is evident that if C is further shifted upwards by a distance E1 to the bottom current point, there will be no tensile stress at the top. The value of E1 is calculated from the expression of stress corresponding to the moment due to the shift in C by E1. How are we calculating E1? If 
C further shifts by E1, it is located at the bottommost current point and the stress at the top becomes 0. That means, the additional moment that is needed to move C upwards by a distance E1 generates a stress at the top which is equal to FCT allowable and it is opposite in sign to the FCT allowable which exists when C is located at a distance E1 between the below the bottom most current point. From this concept we can write that the moment which is given by C times E1 which is equal to P0 times E1 times the distance of the topmost point from the CGC which is C t divided by i is equal to F C t allowable. That is the stress generated due to the additional moment to shift C from a distance E 1 from the bottommost current point to the bottom current point will generate a stress of F C t allowable which is equal and opposite to the stress that occurs when C is at a distance E 1 below the bottom current point. From this expression of the stress, we can calculate E 1, E 1 is equal to F C T allowable times I divided by P 0 times C T. If we substitute I is equal to A R square, where A is the cross section and R is the radius of gyration and we are substituting R square by C t is equal to K b, we have an expression of E 1 equal to F c t allowable A K b divided by P 0. The distance of the CGS below the bottom current point is given as follows, E 1 plus E 2 is equal to M S w plus F C T allowable times A times K B divided by P 0. The eccentricity E is calculated from the following equation, E is equal to E 1 plus E 2 which is the distance of the C G S from the bottom current point plus the distance of the bottom current point from the C G C that gives the total eccentricity and E is equal to M S W plus F C T allowable times A times K B whole divided by P 0 plus K B. Thus, we have got an expression of the eccentricity of the C G S with respect to C G C, which is a slightly more involved equation as compared to the expression for type 1 member. We shall compare these expressions later. Once we have calculated the eccentricity, we are recomputing the effective pre-stress P e and the area of pre-stressing steel A p. Under the total load, C may lie outside the current region which is unlike type 1 members. The highest permissible location of C due to the total load is determined by the allowable tensile stress at the bottom. The following sketch explains the highest possible location of C due to the total moment m t. What we find is when the total moment during the service condition is acting, C has shifted up even beyond the current region because we are allowing tensile stress at the bottom and the distance by which it crosses the top current point is represented as E 3 and it depends on the tensile stress that we allow at the bottom. Thus, the highest permissible location of C due to total moment at service depends on how much tension we allow at the bottom. From the previous figure, the expression of E 3 is obtained by the tensile stress generated due to the shift of C beyond the upper current point. It is the same concept that we have used to calculate E 1. Here the moment is P e times E 3, then 
the distance of the bottom fiber from the CGC which is CB divided by I gives the tensile stress at the bottom which is FCT allowable. Thus E3 is equal to FCT allowable times I divided by PE times CB and just as before substituting I is equal to A R square and R square by CB is equal to KT we find E3 is equal to FCT allowable A times KT divided by PE. The shift of C due to the total moment gives an expression of PE. The total moment equal to PE times the total shift of the compression from the CGS which is equal to E plus KT plus E3 and once we substitute the expression of E3 we are transposing the terms to express PE equal to MT minus FCT allowable A times KT the whole divided by E plus KT. Thus we have got an expression of the effective pre stress. The procedure is based on the concept that first we are locating the CGS as down as possible where even under self weight we are allowing some tension to be at the top and hence C is even bottom the below the bottom current point. Next we are allowing the maximum shift of C under service load conditions and here C can shift even beyond the current region depending on how much tensile stress we allow at the bottom. The purpose of developing these equations based on the lowest most possible of the CGS and the maximum distance traveled by C gives a, an economical design. Hence the purpose is that we are economizing on the amount of pre-stressing steel and the amount of pre-stressing force that we need. Considering that the effective pre-stress is equal to about 70 percent of the characteristic tensile strength, the area of the pre-stressing steel is recomputed as follows, AP is equal to PE divided by FPE. Next we are recomputing the eccentricity again. First the value of P0 is updated, the eccentricity E is recomputed with the updated value of P0. If the variation of E from the previous value is large, another cycle of computation of the pre-stressing variables can be undertaken. Thus we see that it may need a few cycles of calculations. At first we are calculating the eccentricity from which we are calculating the effective pre-stress then again from the effective pre-stress we are calculating the pre-stress at transfer and the eccentricity. If the second value of eccentricity is quite different from the first value of eccentricity then we are recomputing the effective pre-stress and the uh, area of pre-stressing steel and until we converge we can carry on this computations. Fourth step is that check the compressive stresses in concrete. The maximum compressive stress in concrete should be limited to the allowable values. At transfer the stress at the bottom should be limited to FCC allowable where FCC allowable is the allowable compressive stress in concrete at transfer and this is available from figure 8 of IS 1343-1980. At service the stress at the top should be limited to FCC allowable where FCC allowable is the allowable compressive stress in concrete under service loads and this is available from figure 7 of IS 1343-1980. Thus in the fourth step we are checking the compressive stresses to be within the allowable value. Now how do we compute the compressive stresses? At transfer the stress at the bottom can be calculated from the stress diagram as shown that C is located at a distance K1 
below the bottom current point, then since the stress block is not triangular, we cannot calculate F B the way we did for type 1 members. We are calculating F B from the concept of the decomposition of the stress into the various components. F B equal to first the uniform component which is minus C by A and next the varying component due to the eccentricity of the C with respect to the C G C which is given as minus C times K B plus E 1 which is the total eccentricity of C from the C G C times C B which is the distance of the bottommost point the whole divided by I. The second term is the varying stress along the depth and when we substitute the expression of E 1 we are trying to regroup these terms and we are expressing the bottom stress as minus C by A within bracket 1 plus K B times C B divided by R square minus C E 1 times C B divided by I. And since we knew that E 1 is related with the allowable tensile stress at the top, we are substituting C E 1 divided by I is equal to F C T allowable divided by C T. This comes from the expression of E 1 and once we substitute the expression of E 1, we find out the value of the stress in the bottom which is given as F B equal to minus C by A within bracket 1 plus C B divided by C T minus F C T allowable times C B divided by C T. Now the term within the bracket in the numerator we can have C T plus C B which is the total depth H and hence we write F B equal to minus C by A times H by C T minus F C T allowable by C T times C B. We have to satisfy the bottom stress to be within the allowable value and once we write this inequality relationship, we are transposing the terms with the area on one side and we find an expression of the area that A should be greater than equal to P0 times H where P0 is the pre stress at transfer divided by FCC allowable times CT minus FCT allowable times CB. If the area of the trial section after the preliminary design is not adequate, then the section has to be redesigned. Thus, here we see an expression of the area of the concrete which is to satisfy the allowable compressive stress at the bottom. Next we are checking the compressive stress at the top under service conditions. The stress at the top can be calculated from the stress diagram at service. Here also we find that F T is equal to the uniform value which is minus C by A then minus the varying component which is the moment due to C which is equal to C times the distance from the C G C which is K T plus E 3 then the whole times C T which is the distance to the top divided by I. We are grouping the terms within the bracket and on the right hand side we have the term with E 3. Earlier we had found an expression of E 3 which is based on the allowable tension at the bottom and from that expression we are writing C times E 3 divided by I is equal to F C T allowable divided by C B. That is from the expression of the E 3 we are substituting that in the expression of F T and we are regrouping the terms and we are writing F T is equal to minus C by A 
times H by C B minus F C T allowable times C T divided by C B. We have to satisfy the stress at the top to be within the allowable value and once we write that inequality relationship and transpose the terms with the area of the cross section on the left hand side, we find that again there is another relationship that the area of the cross section has to be greater than or equal to the effective pre stress P E times H divided by F C C allowable times C B minus F C T allowable times C T. Thus we find a second condition for the area of the cross section to satisfy which is from the condition that the stress at the top has to be within the allowable compressive value at service. Now this set of equations are general form of the equations that we have seen for type 1 members. Let us compare the two sets of equations. First, we are writing the expressions of the eccentricity E for type 1 E is equal to the shift of the C due to self wet moment plus K B. For type 2 the shift of the compression plus a certain distance below the bottommost current point is there in the term and we find that the term which has been shown by this orange ellipse that this is the additional term we have in the expression of eccentricity for type 2 members. For type 1 member the allowable tensile stress is actually 0 and that means if we substitute F C T allowable equal to 0 in this expression then we find that it is the same expression as that for type 1 member. Similarly, for the effective pre stress, we had found that for type 1 member, the effective pre stress is equal to the total moment divided by the shift of the C, which was E plus KT. Now, for type 2 member, there is an additional term in the numerator which is related with the tensile stress that we are allowing at the bottom. Again, if we apply this second equation to type 1 member, then we are substituting F C T allowable equal to 0 and once we substitute that we find that the second equation for type 2 member is the same equation corresponding equation for type 1 member. Next let us see the expressions for the areas. The minimum area based on stress at bottom at transfer for type 1 member we have an expression which is P0H divided by FCC allowable times CT whereas for type 2 member we have an additional term in the denominator which is related with FCT allowable. Similarly, the minimum area based on stress at the top at service here also we find that the expression for the type 2 member has an additional term in the denominator which is related with the FCT allowable. Thus, for all the four expressions for type 2 member, if we substitute F C T allowable equal to 0, we get the expressions for type 1 member. Thus, what we have studied today for type 2 member is a general form of the equations that we had seen for the type 1 member. If you are designing for type 3 members, then the only difference is that the allowable stress F C T allowable is different for a type 3 member from a type 2 member. Otherwise the expressions for type 2 member are applicable for a type 3 member. Next let us understand this design procedure with the help of an example. Design a simply supported type 2 pre stress beam with the total moment is equal to 435 kilonewton meter including an estimated self wet moment MSW is equal to 55 kilonewton meter. The height of the beam is restricted to 920 millimeters. The pre stress at transfer FP0 is equal to 1035 newton per millimeter square 
and the pistons at surface FPE is equal to 860 Newton per millimeter square. Based on the grade of concrete, the allowable compressive stresses are 12.5 Newton per millimeter square at transfer and 11 Newton per millimeter square at service. The allowable tensile stress says are 2.1 Newton per millimeter square at transfer and 1.6 Newton per millimeter square at service. The properties of the pre-stressing strands are given below. Type of pre-stressing strand is 7 watt strand, nominal diameter is 12.8 millimeters and the nominal area is 99.3 millimeter square. The problem is exactly similar as that we have seen for the type 1 member except that now we have to design the member as a type 2 member instead of what we had designed earlier as a type 1 member. First, we are doing the preliminary design. The height and the self weight moment are given. We have to estimate the lever arm based on the ratio of the self weight moment to the total moment. The ratio of the self weight moment to the total moment is equal to 55 divided by 435 which is, is equal to 12.5 percent. Since the self weight moment is less than about 30 percent of the total moment, we are estimating the lever arm to be 50 percent of the total height which is equal to 0 0.5 times 920 equal to 460 millimeter. Thus, we have an estimate of the lever arm for the total moment. Next, we are estimating the effective pre-stress, the moment due to imposed loads which is denoted as MIL that is equal to MT minus MSW is equal to 435 minus 55 equal to 380 kilo Newton meter. The effective pre-stress PE is equal to the imposed load moment divided by the lever arm. That means, when the self weight moment is small, the effective pre-stress and the lever arm is related by the imposed load moment, which is the moment in excess of the self weight moment. And from that concept, we are estimating the pre-stressing force to be equal to MIL divided by Z equal to 380 times 10 to the power 3 divided by 460 is equal to 826 kilonewtons. The area of the pre-stressing steel AP is equal to PE divided by FPE and FPE is given as 860 Newton per millimeter square. Once we substitute the values of the two variables, we get AP is equal to 960 millimeter square. Thus, at the end of the pre-stress, uh, the preliminary design, we find that we need an area of steel which is equal to 960 millimeter square. At the fourth step of the preliminary design, we are estimating the area of cross section to have average stress in concrete equal to half of the allowable compressive stress. The area is equal to PE divided by half of the allowable compressive stress and we find that is equal to 826 times 10 to the power 3 divided by 0 0.5 times 11 which is the allowable compressive stress at service which gives us an area of 150 times 10 to the power 3 millimeter square. The following trial section has the required depth and the area. We are selecting an I section with a depth of 920 to satisfy the depth requirement. We are selecting the width of the web and the depth of the flange to be 100 millimeters. Then we can find out the width of the flange that we need to satisfy the requirement of area and the width of the flange has come out to be 390 millimeters. At the end of the preliminary design, we have come up with a trial section and next we have to calculate the geometric properties of the trial section. The section is symmetric 
about the horizontal axis. Hence, the CGC lies at mid depth. The section is divided into three rectangles for the computation of the geometric properties. Here we see that the centroid of the top rectangle is at a distance of 410 millimeters from the CGC and the distance of the top fiber CT is equal to 460. First we are checking the area of the cross section. A is equal to 2 times the area of the first rectangle plus the area of the second rectangle equal to 150,000 millimeter square. Thus, this section satisfies the requirement of the area from the preliminary design. Next, we are calculating the moment of inertia of the section and the moment of inertia about an axis through the CGC I is equal to 2 times the moment of inertia of the first rectangle plus the moment of inertia of the second rectangle. Now, for the moment of inertia of the first rectangle, we are using the parallel axis theorem, which is the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis plus the area of the section times the distance square, where distance is the distance between the centroid of the section and CGC. We are substituting the terms. The moment of inertia about the centroid is 1 by 12 times the breadth which is 390 times the depth cube which is 100 cube plus the area which is 390 times 100 times the distance square which is 410 square and the whole multiplied by 2 for the two areas 1 and 3. For the second area, the centroid coincides with CGC and hence the moment of inertia about CGC is equal to 1 by 12 times the breadth which is 100 times the depth cube which is 70 to the power 3. And we get I is equal to 1.6287 times 10 to the power 10 millimeter 4. Square of the radius of gyration R square is equal to I by A which is equal to 1.6287 times 10 to the power 10 divided by 150,000 which gives 108580 millimeter square. Current levels of the section KT equal to KB is equal to R square by CT equal to 108580 divided by 460 which is equal to 236 millimeters. Summary after the preliminary design. The properties of the sections are as follows. We know the area, we know I, we know the distances of the extreme fibers from CGC and we know the current levels from CGC. Now the bottom and the top values are same because the section is symmetric about the horizontal axis. We have also have an estimates of the pre-stressing steel that AP is equal to 960 millimeter square and PE is equal to 826 kilonewtons. Next, we are moving on to the final design. Here we are designing as a type 2 member. First, we are calculating the pre-stress at transfer which is equal to the estimated area times the pre-stress at transfer which is equal to 1035 which gives P0 is equal to 99 3.6 kilonewtons. From this we are calculating E1 plus E2 which is equal to MSW plus FCT allowable times A times KB divided by P0 and we have substituted the values of the variables to get E1 plus E2 is equal to 130 millimeters. The eccentricity of the CGS from the, CG, uh, from the CGC equal to E which is given as E1 plus E2 plus KB which is equal to 130 plus 236 equal to 366 millimeters. We are recomputing the effective pre-stress and the area of the pre-stressing steel the effective pre-stress equal to MT minus FCT allowable times A times KT 
whole divided by E plus KT. And once we substitute the values of the variables, we get PE is equal to 625.6 kilonewtons. Since PE is substantially lower than the previous estimate of 826 kilonewtons, AP, P0 and E need to be recalculated. That means here we find a situation where the effective pre-stress is quite different from the value after the preliminary design and hence we are recomputing the eccentricity and the other pre-stressing variables. Recompute AP equal to PE by FPE which is 625.6 times 10 to the power 3 divided by 860 is equal to 727 millimeter square. Again this value is substantially lower than the value after the preliminary design which was 960 millimeter square. To recompute E we are first calculating P0 which is equal to AP times FP0 is equal to 727 times 1035 is equal to 752.4 kilonewtons. Then the eccentricity is given as E equal to MSW plus FCT allowable times A times KB divided by P0 plus KB and with, once we substitute the variables we find E is equal to 172 plus 236 which is equal to 408 millimeters. Here we have to check that whether E is satisfying the cover requirements or not and we shall find that based on the cover requirements we have to reduce E to 400 millimeters. To check the cover requirements assuming the outer diameter of duct equal to 54 millimeters this information is available from the supplier of ducts depending on how many strands we need to place within the duct. Then the clear cover of the duct is equal to 460 minus 400 which is the eccentricity minus half times the outer diameter of the duct which gives a clear cover of the duct equal to 33 millimeters. The clear cover is greater than 30 millimeters which is satisfactory as per clause 11.1.6.2 of IS 1343-1980. If we need to have larger cover for extreme environments then we have to reduce E and thus in this case the eccentricity is governed by the cover requirements and not exactly by the expressions based on the stress. Since the E has changed from 366 millimeters to 400 millimeters, the pre-stressing variables are recomputed. We have been able to increase the E substantially up to 400 millimeters and we shall find that we will be able to reduce the pre-stressing force. PE is equal to MT minus FCT allowable times A times KT divided by E plus KT and once we substitute this values we find PE equal to 592 kN. Thus PE has further reduced from 625.6 kN AP and P0 are recalculated. AP is equal to 592 times 10 to the power 3 divided by 860 which is equal to 688.5 millimeter square. Select 7 7 bar strands with AP is equal to 7 times 99.3 which is equal to 695.1 millimeter square. The tendons can be placed in one duct and the outer diameter of the duct is 54 millimeters. P0 which is the pre-stress at transfer is equal to 695.1 which is the area of the pre-stressing steel times the FP0 value which is 1035 which is equal to 719.4 kilonewtons. Since the maximum possible eccentricity is based on cover requirements the value of E is not updated. We cannot update the value of E any further because anyhow E is limited based on the cover and not based on the allowable stresses. Thus we have come to the end of the final design for the pre-stressing variables 
and next we have to check the compressive stress in the concrete. At transfer we have the expression of A which is based on the pre-stressing force at transfer and once we substitute the variables A should be greater than 138352 millimeter square. At surface we have A which is based on the pre-stress effective pre-stress at surface and that value is 126631 millimeter square. Thus we have two requirements of area and we are selecting the higher value the governing value of A is 138352 millimeter square. Initially we had assumed a section which has an area of 150,000 millimeter square and now we find that the requirement of the area is much lower and hence we can revise the section. The width of the flange is reduced to 335 millimeters the area of the revised section is 139000 millimeter square which satisfies the minimum requirement based on the allowable compressive stresses. Another set of calculations can be done to calculate the geometric properties precisely, but we shall find that uh, the pre-stressing variables will not change much based on this new set of ge geometric variables. Thus at the end of the final design we have come to a cross section which first satisfies the depth requirement of 920 millimeters, the flange width is 335 millimeters, the width of the web is 100, depth of the two flanges is also 100, the CGS is located at a distance of 400 from the CGC and this is based on the cover requirements and the amount of pre-stressing steel is 7 of 7 bar strands with P0 is equal to 719 kilonewtons. This is the end result of the design for type 2 members. Now let us compare what we had achieved for the design of a type 1 member compared to the one that we have achieved for type 2 member. Once we compare the two sections the type 1 and type 2 members what we find is that for the type 1 member the flange width was larger which was 435 compared to type 2 which is 335 because the area of the type 1 member was larger as compared to type 2. Thus eccentricity was smaller for type 1 member which is 290 as compared to the eccentricity for type 2 which is 400. The amount of steel required in the type 1 member was also large it required 10 of 7 bar strands and for the type 2 we needed only 7 of the 7 bar strands and also the pre-stress at transfer for type 1 member was higher which was 994 kilonewtons and the pre-stress at type 2 member is 719 kilonewtons. Comparing this we can draw these conclusions that in type 2 section the amount of pre-stressing steel and the pre-stressing force are less than those in type 1 section. Also the cross-sectional area is small and hence the type 2 section is relatively economical as compared to type 1 section. This is the reason why we allow some tension in the concrete. In the early developments of pre-stressed concrete the designers were hesitant to have any tensile stress in the concrete but it was found later that we can allow tensile stress in the concrete because most of the time the structure does not see the characteristic load is not subjected to the 95 percent value of the load and hence the allowing some tensile stress is not detrimental to the section and we will get a more economical section if we design it as a type 2 member. Also the second conclusion is 
the eccentricity in type 2 section is larger than in type 1 section. Thus, for unit pre-stressing force, the pre-stressing is more effective in type 2 section. That if we just compare the say the camber or the upward deflection due to unit pre-stressing force at that particular eccentricity, we find that the camber in the type 2 member will be larger than in type 1 member and hence the pre-stressing force will be more effective in a type 2 member since the eccentricity is large. Now, with this benefits, we come to the end of this lecture that today we studied the final design of a type 2 member and first we recapitulated that what are the variables available for design. We found that the available variables are the moment due to dead load and the moment due to live load. And then what are the unknown variables in a design? We do not know the member cross section and the self fed moment. We do not know the pre-stressing variables, the area of the pre-stressing steel, the effective pre-stressing force and the eccentricity at the critical section. Also, we need to select the material properties before the design. Now, the design process is conveniently grouped into two stages. The first is the preliminary design where we select a preliminary section and estimate the pre-stressing variables. We first select the material properties, then we select a depth. If the depth is based on architectural requirement, then that is the governing criteria or else we can select the depth based on some empirical relationship which is related with the total moment. From the depth, we calculate the lever arm that is possible and we estimate the lever arm as a fraction of the total depth. We calculate the effective pre-stressing force which is the moment divided by the lever arm and from the effective pre-stressing force, we estimate the amount of pre-stressing steel that we need, which is the effective pre-stressing force divided by the effective pre-stress, which can be taken as 70 percent of the characteristic strength. We also make a check for the area of the concrete section, which should be such that the stress at the level of CGC should be not too high than 50 percent of the allowable compressive stress at service. Now, after preliminary design, once we have this set of preliminary variables, we move on to the final design. In the final design, we compute the eccentricity accurately. The eccentricity is given as the total moment divided by the estimated pre-stressing force. From the eccentricity, we may need to calculate the effective pre-stress once again and we may recompute the eccentricity. If the second value of the eccentricity is quite different from the first value of eccentricity, then we do one another cycle of calculations of the pre-stressing variables till we converge to a result which is acceptable and also we need to check that the eccentricity satisfies the cover requirement. See our, in the design, our aim is to increase the eccentricity as much as possible and to allow the compression to shift through the maximum distance, so that the pre-stressing force to be applied is less, but we cannot violate the cover requirements. Hence at times, the eccentricity may be determined by cover and not by the stress conditions. Now, once we have design the eccentricity, the pre-stressing force and the amount of pre-stressing steel, we need to check the section for the compressive stresses in the concrete. There are two conditions, one is based on the compressive stress in the bottom during transfer and the other is based on the compressive stress at the top during service. Now, these two conditions gives two minimum values of the area of the cross section. 
and if our trial section is not satisfactory then we have to again redesign the cross section. Now once the cross section is redesigned we can go through another round of computations for the pre-stressing variables. Now what we have found that the, S, the procedure is same for type 1 and type 2 members. The only difference is in type 1 we are not allowing any tension during transfer or service, but for type 2 we are allowing tension and the equations that we have seen for the type 1 and type 2 we compared them side by side and what we have found that the equations for type 2 members are general in nature which has one term which is related with the allowable tensile stress. Now, if we equate the allowable tensile stress to be 0 then we get back the equations that we use for type 1 member. Thus the equations of type 2 member are more general as compared to the equations for type 1 member. If we design a type 3 member then we can use the same equations for type 2 member because the, there also we allow some tensile stress but the tensile stress is higher than type 2 members and hence the design procedure of type 3 members is just same as type 2 members the only difference being the allowable tensile stress. We solved a problem first we had solved this section as a type 1 member and next we designed the section as a type 2 member and when we compared the two results we have found that the area of the type 2 member is less than the area of the type 1 member. The eccentricity of the type 2 member was large, the amount of pre-stressing steel was small for the type 2 member and the amount of pre-stressing force at tra transfer was also small for a type 2 member. These are the reasons why the type 2 is considered to be economical compared to type 1 and hence in many cases we design the section to be as a type 2 member and we allow tension stress in the concrete. We may also design a section as a type 3 member where we feel that the cracking under the characteristic load which may be occurring for a very short time is not detrimental for the structure. Like this we will get a more economical section and hence a partial pre-stress section which is the type 3 section can be more economical than a limited pre-stress section which is a type 2 section which can again be more economical than a type 1 section which is a fully precious section. But we just need to be sure that if you are designing the section as a type 3 section then we have to make sure that there will not be any concern regarding the durability during the service life of the structure. With this we are ending the design of pre-stressed concrete sections for flexure. In our next class we shall study about some of the more design variables which are helpful in placing the strand along the member and to select the cable profile and then we shall move on to a graphical method of designing pre-stress concrete sections. Thank you.